All right, Killer Angels, here we are with another episode of Killer Angels TV. I'm here with Phil tonight, who is our... Our, hey, Phil, how are you? I'm good, man. How about you, buddy? Who is our artillery I'm expert? Here, man. Yeah, I can't complain here. Um, uh, he's going to come here tonight, and uh, he's our artillery expert, and he's going to tell us a little bit about it. Phil, uh, you know, from the... Before the Civil War, uh, you know, the Napoleonic Wars up in the Mexican War, you know, uh, cannons. Tell us a little bit about cannons and, you know, their accuracy and how far were they good from? And, you know, what, what well, kind they, of they were, they, in, in field artillery, there were basically three kinds of guns. There were guns, which are designed to shoot a, a ball or a shell or canister shot flat. Um, most of them had a range between 1,500 and 1,800 yards maximum. They shot a solid shot, which everybody thinks of as a cannonball. They shot shell, which uh, was a smooth bore um, during the Mexican War, and it had a time fuse, and it, you'd have to cut the fuse to the right length, and it would explode at a set distance from the muzzle. They it's also had what, was called, had what was called case shot. Case shot was developed by a guy in the British Army in, in the 1780s, his last name was Shrapnel, which is a word we still use today. Oh, um, it is, what a neat story. Yeah. It, it, uh, uh, Captain Henry Shrapnel, the Royal Artillery, invented the case shot, which is basically a thin wall shell that has iron or lead balls inside of it and a bursting charge. So that when it goes off, all those lead balls or iron balls go out in a pattern like a shotgun from the point where the shell explodes. So that was very effective against infantry. Then you had canister shot. Everybody thinks they used a lot of grape shot. Grape shot was naval or seacoast guns or prior to the American Revolution. By the end of the American Revolution, they were using canister. And a canister is basically, if you can imagine, a Campbell's soup can filled with ball bearings. It was like a giant shotgun. Oh, wow. Yeah, it, 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 it was very devastating at close range, up to about 200 yards. Um, during the Mexican is- War... During the this Mexican the, Wars, okay, yeah, go ahead. Now, this was prior to the Civil War. This is all this leading up to the Mexican War. Yeah, okay. yeah this is this is Mexican War tech. This is the okay. stuff that a, a lieutenant named Thomas J. Jackson was using in Mexico, and he I made think major I've heard of him. Yeah, Stonewall Jackson was was a, was an artillery lieutenant in, in Mexico, and he okay. he 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 manned a battery of six pounder bronze guns. Now, the, the other type of gun was the howitzer. The howitzer had a bigger bore diameter and a small powder chamber in the back. It was designed to lob shells up so it would land inside of a fortress, and it never fired solid shot because the, the, the walls of the cannon were so thin. They only fired shell, case, and canister out of the howitzer. Okay. Uh, hey, uh, one quick question for you. Uh, f- just for our viewers, tell, me, tell us how many guns are in a battery. Um, well, during the Mexican War, it was six guns. It was four guns and two howitzers in a standard U.S. artillery battery. During the Civil War, that changed up. Um, in the Union Army, um, it still stayed six guns. But in the Confederate Army, it was reduced in 1862 to four guns. Okay. Um, and by the time the Civil War came around, by 1863, rather than having it split up with a mixture of guns and howitzers, for the most part, they tried to make it a homogenous battery where all the guns were the same caliber and type so that you wouldn't have a logistics problem of trying to get ammunition for that battery. So you might have one guy with his battery would have all, all, all of one type of guns and another guy would have all one type of guns. That's that what you're saying? Right. right. Uh, it didn't work that well uh, to start with, especially in the West. You had some uh, batteries, both Union and Confederate, that had three different types of guns in it, and it was just a logistics nightmare. Oh, I can imagine trying to get that kind of ammunition back and forth uh-huh. uh, yeah. to that. Okay. Um, so you said 200, um, two, 200, three, two, two to 300 yards was how good range was of a, was, uh, okay. What about the other cannons during the uh, uh, A howitzer, uh, you're looking at about 1,000 to 1,100 yards. Your guns were uh, uh, 13 to 1,500 yards. Uh, the, your heavy 12-pounders could go to 1,800. But okay, uh, that was a little, bit diff- a, little, a little further than what I thought. Yeah. Um, now, that's not pinpoint accuracy. That's b- being able to shell a, an area. 
Okay. Uh, All right. uh, uh, you, you could hit a man-sized target almost every time if you were a good gunner um, at four to 500 yards. I mean, literally, I could, I, you, you could put a 12-pound solid shot and turn a man into paste at about four or 500 yards first shot if you're a well-trained gunner. Okay. So, and, that, and that's pre-Civil War. Now, during this, uh, at the, uh, in the years right before the Civil War, there was a major thing. There was a real game changer in artillery, and that was the advent of rifled artillery. I think I might have heard something about that too. Yeah, uh, Robert Parker Parrott in eight, in 1855 uh, developed a system of artillery that used rifling, and it had a uh, his shell his shells, which were developed by a man named Reed, um, who actually ended up being an, a Confederate ordnance officer during the war. Had it had a hollow cup on the back. You load it down the barrel. And it was a elongated shell, it looked like a cylinder with a rounded nose, and it had a cup on the back. And when the, when the cannon went off, that cup expanded into the rifle, just like a mini ball, and gave it some range. And that took your range from fifteen hundred to eighteen hundred yards, and it would put it out there twenty five hundred yards, three thousand yards, and in some of your bigger guns, like your thirty pounder pair, that's four, uh, over four thousand yards. So you're looking okay, at okay. So so um, the the of course, you still only use canister up close. I wasn't thinking about yeah. that. You use so, canister uh, up close, shell in case. Was it still two, 200 yards, what it was good from? I mean, I know yeah, canister, spread, Yes. Now, uh, with rifle guns, canister tended to throw a kind of a flaky pattern. So right. uh, it was just a matter of fake because the, the rifling would cause that. Uh, spray that, the, and the, it's, it's kind of like in modern day technology, you know, you'd, you'd end up shooting a. Uh, if you shot regular bird shot through a rifle deer slug barrel, you might have open holes in that in that pattern that uh, would let a, a man walk through it. Now, when so, you get up close, fifty yards, something like that, it's like walking into a, walking into iron hail. I mean, it's horrible. Four, four thousand yards, okay. So, uh -huh. uh, I mean, or excuse me, four thousand. Um, um, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I lost my fit. Uh, so four thousand yards. So I mean, you're 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 getting close to um, um, you know, miles. I mean, um, right. The the longest range artillery piece in the Civil War was actually one of the smallest bore ones. It was a two point six inch weird rifle, and because of the way the carriage was set up, it had a range of six miles. In the Civil War, they had a gun that went six miles. Yes. Yeah, Norman Weir, who was a Canadian. Came to the United States. So he developed a. I, I actually own a weird rifle. Um, and it, it I had thought a range just six miles. For me, I, you know, I and I guess maybe it was, you know, I thought for me, you know, uh, you know, guns went no further than a mile. You know, after that. Oh no. Um, it, all right, okay, so explain to me, like, um, I, I've got to give them that, like, um, when um, charge, like, you know, Gaines Mill or. Biggest charge or whatever. When when the guns opened up on Cemetery Ridge, those guns mm -hmm. right there, was it a wide range of guns? I mean, or was these you know they could hit from a certain distance, or was these guns that could, was hitting from four miles away? Um, um, or you, well, any of those types of battles? Like, um, hey, are you still getting me? Because something happened with my phone. I've got, I've got you. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, something happened with my phone, and all of a sudden I'm there. We go. I think I'm still yeah, there. I can still see you and hear you. Okay, well, I can't see anything, so I'm just going to keep talking. Um, all right, well, uh, Pickett's Charge, let's just, let's just take Pickett's Charge. Uh, you had um, over 100 guns facing the field at Pickett's Charge of various guns from as big as 20 right, say that again. You had, rifles you had, you had, to... Uh, say, that, say that again. Yeah, start, you, you kind of, Pickett's Charge, you had what now? You had hundreds of guns facing the field that the Pickett's men were crossing. Okay. You had a, uh, you had you uh, had everything on the smallest end to three inch rifles, um, to uh, twenty pounder Parrot rifles, ten pounder Parrot rifles. You had James rifles, which shot a fourteen pound shell, and you had lots of the twelve pound Napoleon, which is one of the workhorses of the war. I mean, literally, you. Uh, uh, it, it would fire. It was a smooth bore. It was the last of the great smooth bores, and it, it it would fire canister and everything very accurately. Um, so, but I, I have to, I have walked people through Pickett's Charge from an artilleryman's point of view. If you don't mind, I'll take about five minutes to, to do that for you, yeah, and I'll right focus ahead. on I'll focus on one battery of Pickett's Charge, and that was Cushing's battery, who was right behind the stone wall at the high water mark. 
for Armour uh, State. Um, Cushing's battery had six three-inch ordnance rifles. Now, when, when Pickett's men walked out of the woods, they were at extreme long range. And uh, Cushing's battery started firing with percussion shell. That means shells that exploded on impact. Um, as they marched forward, um, they were under fire from their guns plus hundreds of other guns. But I'm just focusing on uh, Cushing's battery right now. And until they got to some of the fences that slowed them down, they, they were being under fire by a percussion shell. Now, these did, this, th these did very little physical injury, but they did do, uh, they did, you know, demoralize people because they'd bury in the ground and it'd explode. Um, as about the time they got halfway across that first section of field, um, you're about th three quarters of a mile from the high water mark. They switched to air bursting the shells using time fuse. And it was a, they used a mixture of case shot and canister shot. And this is where you started to see really a lot of artillery casualties. Um, oh, when, you said, air, when you said air, so it exploded in the air above them? Yes. And then just kind of... Your, your goal, yeah, if you're an artilleryman, your goal is to explode that shell about 10 yards in front of the line of infantry so that the momentum of the shells will carry carry through and, and, and spread those uh, fragments and got you, got you. down into the, front, the, into the front of that infantry line. Now, when they started crossing those fences before they got to the Emmitsburg Road, that's where they really started taking heavy artillery casualties. Um, but they kept closing the line and forming up, closing the line and forming up. And as they got to the Emmitsburg Road, they were taking uh, both head-on fire and flanking fire from artillery batteries. That, um, and it, it was just tearing them to pieces. And at this point, no Union infantry had even fired a shot yet. They were way outside of infantry uh, musket range. Um, as they, like that, when Gettysburg, he says that, Long, when Longstreet says, then they'll be up under the range of aimed muskets. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't until they got uh, across the Emmitsburg Road and started going up that long slope that the infantry really got into it. It was it was an artillery show up till that point. Um, and as they kept closing up and closing up, they when they got to about three hundred yards, Cushing's battery started loading canister shot. Um, and when a canister shot goes off out of a three inch rifle, um, it will cover a the the average spread of canister is a ten yard swath at 100 yards. So you're looking at a 30-yard swath, a, a 30-foot swath at 300 yards is what's called the beaten area of canister. So at 300 yards, every time one of those guns would fire, it would, it would throw approximately 72 balls into that area. Now, um, as, they get, as they got closer, they started loading double-shotted canister. At about this point, Mr. Uh, uh, Lieutenant Cushing was injured, wounded, but he refused to be taken off the field. Stop. Um, I, sorry, I'm gonna stop right there. You know, when you said that, I guess that's what he's talking about because I, I remember in uh, in the movie, you can mm -hmm. hear the, um, I guess, commander say, uh, uh, double, double canister, Cushy. <laughs> so I guess that's yeah, who he was talking about. Yeah, double canister. Yeah, which basically means one powder charge in two of those 10 cylinders. Now, as they got closer, inside of 100 yards, the uh, Cushing ordered the unprecedented is something that you did as a last result triple shotted canister triple shot um, that God. there's three canisters on top of there that means you are shooting over 200 one inch round balls out of each one of those guns 200 as, one inch round balls out of each gun right going about 1500 feet per second now i was just shred, uh, it was shredding them yeah well I hate to say this, but um, it was described, and this was on, on our forum. There was a big argument about this one phrase, but it actually came out of a uh, memoir of a member of the third, uh, third North Carolina. That as they crossed the wall, Cushing fired his six guns, and three hundred men disappeared into a pink mist. Hmm. That's Pickett's charge from an artilleryman's point of view. Now. Um, the thing is, without infantry to support you, an artillery battery is very, very, very um, vulnerable. Because we can fire okay. a couple a couple shots a minute, but if you if you're facing an infantry line that can, can maneuver faster than we can, the uh, infant, uh, artillery in the open is dead meat to, art to, to infantry. Um. Yeah. 
I've got a question. I propose this on our I, when we do our little tactical Thursday things, and I was doing the tactics. Uh-huh. Why not instead of I don't know, you probably can't answer this, but I mean, it's a hypothetical. Why, why not the biggest charge or you know the ones? Why not instead of trying to first of all? Before I say, let me ask you this: uh, uh, in the movie Gettysburg. Uh, uh, Shashin says we'll concentrate all of our guns on that mass section of uh, food on fires. Napoleon called, I believe that's right, called right. a fire of wall. Are you aware of any incident where a fire of wall, where you concentrate your guns on a hundred meter or you know just small area of it driving off the enemy totally? I cannot find anywhere where that's ever worked, that, where it just no, destroys. It never has worked completely. Uh, the only place that I have ever found that that, that it, it had succeeded where infantry assault alone didn't was at Shiloh with Ruggles' artillery line at the Hornet's Nest. But it was not a complete victory. Okay. So, to follow up on the question, why not? Uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, you can finish. Well, you, you got to realize that uh, about about 10 to 20% of those shells don't explode. They're duds. That's why my okay. artillery shell collection is so big. Secondly, you... you you have to realize that it's like, it's like today. Why can't we win a war by dropping bombs alone? You know, you, you, you only win a war when you put an infantry infantryman on the ground to set foot on that land. As we and, used uh, to say, um, um, our attorney, boots on the ground. Yeah, so, so, you know, you, you, can, you, can, you, can, you can say you can say that everything's you can say you can win it with firepower, but you never know if you've won it or not until some poor fool has to kick in the door. Well, you know, you know, and I, I told one of my friends last one time, I said, he was talking about our firepower over there. He said, yeah, we can just bomb us. Said, Buddy, you can't occupy territory from 20,000 feet. No. We can blow it up, but until you got people occupied. Okay, so uh, the question I want to ask is... And I, and, I, and I am actually starting to run down on time. Okay, and we'll cut it right here after that, because um, uh, I know you're running out. Uh, why not... you got that kind of artillery. they got that artillery. You're going to make a charge. Why do you not, instead of trying to have this barrage and take out their guns... Engage the batteries where you lock them in a battery duel where they can't focus their guns on the infantry because they're too busy locked up trying to answer answer the, they, the other fire. They, they did do that, and Union artillery was fantastic at counter battery fire. Union artillery was fantastic at counter battery fire. However, um, in an assault such as a Pickett's charge, um, you have to you have to uh, designate the threats that you're gonna uh, that you're gonna face. Right now, long-range artillery might kill you. Charging infantry with bayonets will kill you. So you take the fire from the enemy artillery and you pound the infantry. Fair enough question. Um, well, okay, man. Uh, I'll let you get back to work. That was fantastic. All right, man. All right, anything else you want to add? Anything else um, you want to add about the artillery? Um, no, I will tell, tell people that there, there's a lot of unexploded art, Civil War artillery ordnance out there. If you're digging in the south and you find it, always treat it as if, it, as if it's live. Um, get a hold of me or get a hold of some other Civil War collector. Uh, we know people who can safely make these safe. Don't just call the cops because if you call the cops, you're going to blow them up and you're blowing up a piece of history and something that could be worth up to $1,000. Great, that's some good piece of advice. Hey, tell your friends to subscribe to the channel, man. And uh, as soon as you get back to uh, getting some time, give us some of them great cannon posts again, all right? Well, do. Thank you, man. Bye bye. Bye bye.